in picking up where we left off, right? People have very different ideas about the problems we face, and this influences what they see as the solutions. Um, this is why sustainability is so problematic. Um, and so this sort of brings us into, well, how do anthropologists try to understand and explain this? And so there's two main approaches we'll look at. The first is the interpretive approach, sort of this idea that one's worldview, how they think about things, is going to drive their behavior. Um, the materialist approach is sort of opposite, and I don't think we'll touch on that until we meet again. But before we can get into these specific approaches, we need to talk about just what anthropology is um, in general. And so that's what we will be doing now. So anthropology, the word literally means the study of man, which is gendered, outdated terminology. Um, anthropos meaning man and ology study of. And so anthropology is the study of all of humanity, humans. It's the study of us from a really broad perspective, um, including present, but also the past um, from corners, all the corners of the globe, sort of anywhere that humans exist and in all aspects. So humans as cultural beings, um, social and linguistic beings, and also biologically um, in terms of evolution and adaptation, sort of anything and everything it is about being human. And because anthropologists approach uh, the study of humanity from this sort of broad, all-encompassing perspective, uh, the field is actually divided into four specific subfields. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> archaeology, and these are not in any particular order of importance. Archaeology, biological anthropology, linguistic anthropology, and cultural anthropology. There's also this um, fifth field of anthropology, applied anthropology, and it's aimed at using knowledge gathered from research in the other four subfields and then applying that towards actually solving contemporary human problems. Uh, we'll look at some examples after we look at the four subfields. Um, and so one other thing about anthropology in general is it takes a holistic, comparative, and a relativistic approach. We're going to break each of those down. But real quick, holism means that we try to look at all the different pieces of a culture and how they're interrelated. Um, you can't understand one aspect of a society, whether that's um, economics or religion or moral values, without understanding how it relates to all the other pieces, right? The parts in the context of the whole, if you really want to understand what's going on. The comparative approach. Um, in short, we compare widely through different, across different societies throughout space and time before making any generalization about humans or culture. Um, it's really important because we often mistakenly think what, what's normal and familiar to us applies to people other where, well, I got brain scrambles today. Um, it applies to other people in other cultures and that's not necessarily true. Um, different societies do things differently for different reasons. And then relativism which means that no culture taken as a whole is inherently superior or inferior to another, right? They're different for different reasons. And so we'll dissect those in a bit, a little more. Um, but the four subfields, and again, not in any specific order of importance, um, we'll start with archeology. span And the goal, right, is just to give you an idea of what anthropology is all about. So archeology span focuses on investigating past cultures and societies through excavating material remains. Um, essentially, they dig up artifacts, um, other remains left behind in the dirt from past societies and try to reconstruct the way that that group was living in their environment. How were they using resources? Were they hunting? Were they farming? What was overall health and disease like in that society? So there's two main um, divisions in modern archeology span that we'll look at. There's tons of subdivisions. We care about two. Um, prehistoric and historic archaeology. So prehistoric archaeology looks at sites before the advent of writing. And you can gather a lot of information from the, the material remains you pull up out of the dirt. Um, pollen, charcoal, skeletal remains, um, stone tool deposits, all sorts of stuff gets left behind that allows archaeologists to sort of reconstruct what was going on. Um, so one example of a prehistoric archaeology site comes from um, a cave in the American Southwest. 
And in this cave, they found something called a, it was a coprolite, human coprolite. Does anyone know what a coprolite is? I like to ask, and usually someone knows what it is. Anyone know coprolite? It's poop. Yeah, and not just poop, it's fossilized poop. Good. Um, fossilized human feces, fancy word, coprolite. And so in this cave in the Southwest, they found this coprolite. And in this coprolite was uh, myoglobin, which is a protein found only in human muscle tissue. Um, and so what is one possible inference from this, this coprolite with myoglobin in it in this cave? Yeah, um, you guys all kind of said the same thing. Cannibalism, they were eating humans. Yeah, um, exactly. So how else did this human, this protein from a human muscle tissue get inside this fossilized human feces? Um, could be really good evidence of potential cannibalism, right? You would, of course, hopefully um, substantiate that with other correlating evidence, um, but possible. Um, so prehistoric archaeology, you can actually learn a lot just from things that get left behind that weren't intentionally left behind for anyone to find, right? It's, it was poop or trash or something that archaeologists are digging up. So that's prehistoric. Historic archaeology then is when uh, sites in which writing did exist. Um, and so archaeologists will use uh, tax documents, diaries, land records, any sort of written record of what was going on at the time, and then supplement that with the materials they excavate out of the ground. Um, the Whaley House is a really good example of a historic archaeology site here in San Diego. And it has kind of an interesting history. It's said to be haunted and whatnot. Um, researchers at SDSU actually excavated that site. And so the, the question becomes, um, if you already have the written story, why go to the painstaking effort to, to excavate the site, to dig stuff up out of the dirt? And it's not always, ex it's usually not exciting work, right? It can take months, years, decades, and you can find nothing. Um, it's tedious. And so why, why would archeologists bother scientists care to excavate the site if they already have the written record? Why? Why supplement that? Why not just be done? And there's, there's sort of different ways you can answer that. Um, what do you guys think? Seriously, why, why bother pulling stuff out of the ground? Why not just read the story that was written for us? Um, so Josh said to verify truth. Um, Bianca, a different perspective from those who didn't write the story. Uh, another perspective, Heidi, Amber, written record leaves a lot out. Um, JC, they, maybe they excavate something that wasn't written down and you're supplementing that story. Um, more tangible than the written word. Um, good. So you're hitting on a lot. Basically, who was writing that? Does that person actually represent the whole society? That account is probably going to be partial. Um, yeah, the record's biased. It's partial. Oftentimes, it's the victors that write the history. Right. And so you're getting a skewed perspective and you might not really be getting a, a holistic account of what was going on. And so you excavate so that you can either verify and sort of supplement what you're finding in the written record or it might contradict it. Right. Um, like for so, for example, um, tr trash is honest. Trash is more honest than what people write in their diary. Like if you write something down, you might think about what you actually put. Um, let's just pretend you keep a diary or you have it sometime in the past um, because someone might read that one day, right? But what we throw in the trash, which is essentially the stuff archaeologists are picking up out of the dirt, we don't usually think about that. Like, you know, who, oh my God, who's going to see that? Probably no one. Um, so like, for example, you say, let's see, say um, Sally. Is anyone named Sally? I want to use your name. Um, and Bobby will go with, yeah. They uh, sort of Sally's writing in her diary and, oh, I had such a great night and Bobby, you know, took me on this date and he held my hand and he paid for the meal and blah, 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 blah. Okay. You go look in Sally's trash can the next day and there's empty bottles of Tito's vodka and whips and chains and all sorts of crazy shit, right? And so the written story might tell you part of it, but it's by no means always the whole story, right? So we excavate, we supplement that to try to get a more holistic picture of what's going on. One more thing about archeology. 
is it's not about sort of, it's not the Indiana Jones caricature, um, trying to find valuable treasures or tomb raiding. Archaeologists are scientists. So um, the goal is to reconstruct how societies were living in their environments uh, long ago. The next subfield we're going to look at is biological anthropology. And so unlike cultural anthropologists, biological anthropologists focus on the biological dimensions of humans. So these folks focus on human evolution, how and why did anatomically modern homo sapiens evolve into the form that we are? What, why are we bipedal? We're the only true biped on the planet. Um, that's where lower back problems come from. Um, in order to stand upright, uh, like a chimp's spine, for example, is parabolic. Humans have this S shape in it and those weak points in the curves, that's usually where we have most of our injuries. Um, sort of the price of bipedalism. But so why, what was the advantage of becoming bipedal? This is the kind of stuff that biological ants look at. And also human variation. Um, how and why do different populations vary physically, genetically? And, and so I just want to say, like, I would expect you all to know, sort of, if I asked you, you know, what subfield digs stuff up out of the dirt to reconstruct the past, I would expect you to know that's archaeology. Um, same, you kind of want to know what the subfields are. But um, I'm giving you a lot of extra info just so you know sort of what's it, what it's about, right? Because um, I like anthropology, I think it's cool. So I wanna convince you also that it's relevant and interesting. Um, biological ants, we look at humans, but also non-human primates. So humans are a primate, and we also study the non-human primates to try to gain insight into the human condition. Um, the non-human primates, apes, monkeys, and prosimians. And these folks study the living contemporary populations, also the recently dead through skeletal remains and the long dead through fossilized remains. So within BioAnth, there's several different sub subfields. And I'm just gonna highlight some of them for you to give you an idea of, of the flavor of this subfield. So starting with the top, uh, biological evolution, again, interested in the evolution of anatomically modern homo sapiens and also evaluating where we fit in, uh, evaluating evolutionary relationships between different species. So for example, chimpanzees, our closest living biological relative, we share about 98.7% of our DNA with them. Human variation and human adaptability are sort of two closely related subfields. So a lot of uh, human variation that we see around the globe um, body stature or other examples is due to these groups adapting in the specific environment they inhabit. So a lot of a lot of variations actually due to environmental adaptation, different human populations living in different regions. Um, can anyone think of, of an example, like a physical trait that you can actually see it if you just scroll through our class right now, um, a physical trait that varies among us and is due to an environmental adaptation. And there's, you know, different examples. Um, <clears throat> skin color? Um, so skin color is a geographical adaptation essentially to this trade-off between blocking out harmful UV radiation in more equatorial regions and also not blocking out so much so that you're unable to synthesize vitamin D. So in equatorial, in equatorial regions, um, you tend to see darker skin pigmentation. Um, the re that is caused by having a higher level of melanin. That's what causes the dark pigmentation. Um, this is adaptive in UV intense regions like the equator. There's so much UV radiation, which can damage DNA, it can cause cancer and other problems, that more melanin was selected for um, as an adaptive advantage to block out the harmful effects of too much UV radiation. Okay, as you move north or south in latitude, sunlight and UV radiation becomes less intense. And I realize it's not a, a perfect gradient and um, longitude matters too, but in general, skin lightens up as we move north and south. Um, at this point, as you move into the northern and southern latitudes, UV is not as intense, but having high levels of melanin and dark pigmentation in these latitudes can actually hinder your body's ability to synthesize vitamin D. So we need UVB radiation to synthesize vitamin D in our epidermis, in our skin, it's just, it's just required. 
Um, and so if you have too much melanin and the UV isn't as intense, um, you're actually not getting enough to synthesize vitamin D, which is a critical nutrient in our development, especially bone growth. So you can get stunted development. If anyone's ever heard of rickets, where sort of the bones literally don't form and they bow out um, and create all sorts of pain and problems, not getting enough vitamin D can cause that. So you're, what you see with skin color is a trade-off, right? More melanin, darker skin around the equators, blocks out harmful effects of UV. There's still enough UV to synthesize vitamin D. You move north or south, UV radiation is not as intense. You don't need high levels of melanin to block it out, but having high levels can be uh, maladaptive, right? Because you're not now not getting enough UVB to synthesize vitamin D. Okay, so it's an it's an environmental adaptation. And then race, um, I'll just say race is basically people uh, looking at skin color and then subjectively ascribing these different categories, right? Um, that's why the number of races changes from five to 55 to seven to 17. That's why your census changes all the time because race is not actually a biological concept. It has zero basis in biology or genetics. It is a social categorization that has in turn had very real effects on people's lives, health, and biology, right? And we're seeing this sort of with COVID. Um, um, another example real quick of adaptability, something called, uh, pigeon chesting. And this is an adaptation that occurs in the high Andes mountains in South America. Um, the term's a little outdated, but the pigeon chesting refers to sort of this puffed out chest. And that puffed out chest is a result of these individuals in this area having larger lungs overall, which means they have a larger lung surface area. Um, and they also have rapidly circulating blood relative to other nearby groups. Uh, any, what is this an adaptation to in this area in the Andes Mountains? What is this pigeon chest, larger lungs, more rapidly circulating blood? What is that? An higher adaptation? elevation. Yeah, higher elevation. There's a much less Lower. oxygen at these high elevations um, or high altitude, good. And so the larger lung surface area allows increased absorption of oxygen. And in addition to the rapidly circulating blood, move it around your body more quickly. Counteract these low oxygen levels at high altitude. Good. Um, primatology, just to touch on a few more. Primatology looks not at humans, but at the non-human primates, monkeys, apes, prosimians. Um, for those of you that have heard of bonobos, sort of pictured on the bottom uh, right, they are the other type of chimp. And what are bonobos known for? Just say it. Lots of sex. Oh, yeah, they don't care if it's their brother or cousin or mother or father. Well done, well done. Um, Sex, yeah, and I like, you ever said love, good. That was like a more gentle way of saying it. They're the make love, not war ape. They are absolutely adorable. And so bio ants, they'll study the non-human primates to try to gain insight into the human condition, our social behavior, um, our anatomy, our evolution. Uh, back in the 70s, sort of Jane Goodall was researching chimpanzees, pan troglodytes, the common chimp. Bonobos are the other type of chimp, pan paniscus. And so the common chimp, pan they, um, they were studying them and they observed some really aggressive behavior. Chimps can be super aggressive, very territorial um, and, and fight and basically like raid each other and kill each other, different troops fighting over resources. And so these early chimp studies were used to argue that humans are actually, or humans are also naturally aggressive um, because they're our closest biological relative, but we are equally related to bonobos from a genetic standpoint, and bonobos exhibit the exact opposite type of behavior. They don't, they're not territorial, they don't fight. Um, when there's sort of conflict, their means of conflict resolution is sex, right? Sexual activity. And um, can't remember who said it, but like they said, it's, it's anything goes, right? Girl, girl, boy, boy, girl, boy, it doesn't matter. It just permeates their society. It's sort of this, the social lubricant, to use a stupid pun, um, that eases tensions, right? So very opposite, equally related to us, sort of really calls into question these arguments about humans being naturally violent or aggressive. Um, it, cause, and humans, kind of the point of that is humans, we're, we can be either or, right? A lot of how you end up has to do with the culture that you're brought up in. Forensic anthropology. Uh, these folks are involved in identifying human remains, um, to, in this case, in a forensic context. So 
um, after a crime, or for example, after 9-11 occurred here in this country, uh, forensic anthropologists were brought in to help identify human remains. And they can do this in different ways. Uh, you can sort of tell the age of the individual by looking at the long bones or the teeth. You can tell the, the sex, whether male or female, by looking at the shape and size of the pelvis, uh, cranial morphology, and even trauma, right? Sort of uh, how did this individual die? What, what might have killed them? You can even look at things like tuberculosis and syphilis. These leave marks on the skeleton too. Um, so you can, you can look at that as well. Uh, and sometimes also you can even extract DNA from the skeletal remains. So forensics, they're involved in identifying, you know, victim remains, um, hopefully give some closure to, to the family. Bioarchaeology is kind of similar. It's about looking, assessing the health and well-being and diet of past sort of prehistoric populations. Um, you can tell what people were eating um, based off the sort of carbon signature it leaves. Like wild plants leave a C3 signature and wheat and corn leave, or corn leaves a C4. So you can actually date exactly when people started farming and eating different foods. Um, paleoanthropology looks at fossil hominins, our human ancestors in the fossil record. I won't ask you about it, nor will I ask you about primate paleontology, fossil non-human primates. The third subfield we'll look at is linguistic anthropology, which I'll refer to just as linguistics. Just know that that's a whole separate thing too. Uh, and so linguistic anthropologists focus on the interrelationships between a group's language and other aspects of that group's culture. Uh, so what is it, how, what is the language, how does it work? What does it sound like? Uh, what does it do for people? How do they use it in different contexts? And so there's several different things they look at, and I'm just gonna touch on a few to kind of give you an idea of what this is all about. Um, one is they look at phonology. How um, are different sounds formed in a language? Morphology, how are words formed? And semantics, how are sentences formed, right? And so our native language, we don't really have to think about this. Um, <coughs> excuse me. But not so. Um, with others. So sem semantics, for example, like when we make a sentence, we use different morphemes, different words, and we add them all together to, you know, make a statement. Other languages, um, polysynthetic languages, it could be just one word with different sort of uh, morphemes or what they call units of meaning is what a morpheme is. Be one word is an entire sentence, right? The same way we say she, um, I laugh or I laugh. Right? I can add that ED onto the end, change the meaning. So you use these basic units of sound and meaning to communicate. So I want to talk about phonology just for a minute. Um, let me switch over to the whiteboard. <coughs> okay, so we're going to do um, an example. Uh, in English, we mark the plural with S, right? Um, this is not a trick, so just S. So what I want you to do is um, I want, so put your hand on your throat, do it, and just start talking because I want you to pay attention to what you're feeling as you talk with your hand on your throat. So it doesn't matter what you say, you're all on mute, so none of us can hear you. You can talk about how great the class is, how much you fucking hate it, uh, whatever. Just talk, 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 so you can feel what happens when you talk. Now, now, what do you feel? Someone, um, if you would, you know, just tell me instead of writing it in the chat. What do you, what do you feel? Not a trick, just what do you feel? Vibrating. Good, good. Okay. I didn't catch all that, but vibrating is, is good. Um, now, put your hand on your throat again, and I want you to sound out just the S. My neighbors are wondering what's going on. Uh, what do you feel with just the S? No vibrating. No. Okay, good. All right. Now what we're going to do is we're going to say the word um, cats in the plural. And you're going to put your hand on your throat again, not just for fun, um, but so you can feel what happens during the S. So it's going to be, we're going to elongate it. So it's going to be cats, cats, and just feel what's going on with it when you're voicing the S. Cats, cats. We'll do one more. Cats. Okay, what do you feel? when you're voicing the S? 
nothing. Yeah. We're, we're going somewhere with this, promise. Nothing in your throat, just in your mouth, using your tongue, but nothing in your throat. Yeah, good. There's no vibration, right? Nothing. Mm -hmm. Good. Accurate. Uh, me too. And that's, that's true for, should be true for most of us. Okay, next one is dogs. Okay, same thing with your hand on your throat. And you're going to elongate that S, okay? And I want you to pay attention to what you feel when you do it. Dogs, 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 dogs dogs notice a difference let's try cats dogs cats dogs does anyone notice a difference between the s in cats versus dogs on what you're feeling a vibration again yeah good so no vibration with cats right cats and then dogs because the sound you are actually making is a z even though we symbolize it with the s for the plural. Um, dogs, because the consonant that precedes that S is going to affect the way that you pronounce it, even though the symbol is the same. So uh, we're almost done with this, but if you just pronounce like a T sound, like a T, and go T, you don't need your hand on your throat for this one, but just think about where your tongue and where your mouth is. Go T, 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 and my tongue's on the top of my mouth, and then do the G. Go G, G, T, G, T, Go. And just notice what a different position your mouth is in. And so it's that consonant, the consonant you voice preceding the S is going to affect how you pronounce the S. Last one. <laughs> it's getting a little sloppy, sorry. Um, we'll just go with old President Georgie. Um, Bush's, Bush's presidency. So hand on throat and pay attention. Um, to the S and what, what's going on there. So bushes, bushes. So cats, dogs was a Z. What sound are we making when we do bushes? Bushes. Like an E sound? Yeah, good. Um, exactly. We're inserting a vowel. And you can argue it's E, Z, or E, S. I, we don't care about that part too much. Um, but we are literally inserting a vowel in there, even though it's not written. Um, try saying bushes without inserting a vowel, like bushes, right? Um, so we actually insert that so that you can then hear the plural. But the reason it's so interesting is we're making, we have one symbol, the S, right? And we're making three different totally sounds, depending on the word, pretty much completely unaware of it, I would assume, at least until now. And it's totally unconscious, and we do it without even thinking about it, right? Um, language is such a powerful tool. And this is also why it can be so difficult to learn another language that's not native to you, right? Because there's all these sort of other informal rules that are going on that you aren't learning necessarily um, formally. So we probably won't talk about uh, phonology ever again, but it's interesting, right? It's so remarkable. We do this regularly without even thinking about it. Language is a really powerful capability of humans. Another interesting thing about language, this property called displacement. I'm not going to ask you about this. Um, displacement refers to the ability to talk about things in space and time that aren't readily present. And one of the powers, for better or worse, of this is you can talk about stuff that doesn't exist like that actually isn't true, but you can create the perception that it's true. Um, and that's really powerful, right? Uh, I'll give you an example. After 9-11, we went to war with Iraq. And the reason we got into the war that sort of got Congress on board was there was this threat of weapons of mass destruction. Um, and so that was enough to push us into it. That, was, that wasn't true, that there was never, there was no weapons of mass destruction. Um, there wasn't even really evidence for it. And the intelligence actually, you know, told them, yeah, don't, don't use this. It's not good intelligence. Um, nonetheless, we went to war. And I remember I was talking, I teach at Palomar too sometimes, and I, we were talking about this one day, and one of my students, her husband was in the Iraq war, and um, he came back and he went out for a second tour, and he, he died. He never came home. And so she kind of raised her hand just to speak to how powerful, this is the power of language, right? We can talk about things that aren't even real, but have actual consequences, right? It's really, really powerful. So language is important. A few other things that linguists look at. 
uh, they look at how language is used in different social contexts. It's called sociolinguistics. So uh, just for example, if uh, you're in the classroom, maybe you call your professors Professor or Professor Sherman or Savannah, because I don't even call me either. I don't care. Um, but if you weren't my student, that would be just weird for you to call me Professor Sherman, be awkward. Um, and then depending on, you know, your opinion of me, maybe you're talking about me to your roommate and you use another term entirely, right? Um, so the point is that the situation we're in, who else we're talking to, who else can hear us, affects sort of the words we choose to use, right? And how we use that. Oops. Uh, Nonverbal communication is another thing linguistic anthropologists look at. So things like posturing, body language, um, the use of space, these all communicate different meanings. Like in the US, typically it's inappropriate to stand two inches from someone's face, right? It makes us uncomfortable. I call them post talkers. Um, because culturally that's just not appropriate. Other, other societies, it may be appropriate. Or eye contact, right? It's seen as sort of a sign of, sign of respect or I'm listening. Um, in sort of Japan or other areas, um, it could be seen as disrespectful, right? So these things all vary, um, but they all communicate meaning. Facial expressions, right? On the top, guy's happy, the girl on the right looks sad. I don't know what the lady in the middle is doing, surprised. Um, all of this communicates meaning. Even the way that you say something, right? Like if you, you come home and your partner or roommate says, oh, you know, what's, what's wrong? And you say, nothing, right? That doesn't mean, that does not mean nothing. Um, so all these other things also go into communicating meaning. Good. And then the last thing, um, just one other thing, this is no, by, by no means everything they look at, endangered languages. Uh, linguistic anthropologists are interested in documenting endangered languages. Um, when the language is on its way out, the culture is right behind it. And that's just empirical. That's what we've seen happen again and again. So one reason anthropologists are interested in working with local communities to help document, actually write down what may have been a completely oral language prior to this, um, to, to keep it from going extinct, right? Because once it's gone, it's gone. And lost language is lost knowledge. Um, there is meaning imbued in languages that doesn't necessarily translate outside of it. Um, I'll give you an example. In uh, this group in the Amazon, they have like 15 different words for soil uh, based off sort of the moisture content and the mineral content, the color, which is indicative of what types of plants you could grow successfully in it. And so they've learned this through, you know, hundreds, maybe thousands of years of interacting with their environment that they rely on to survive. And it's become embedded that knowledge, ecological knowledge is embedded in their language. Uh, when the language goes, that knowledge goes with it, right? Western science hasn't figured everything out. Um, cultural, sort of the last subfield we'll touch on, and, and this is a cultural anthropology class, so this will be our purview for the rest of the semester. Um, cultural anthropologists study the ways of life of contemporary and historically recent populations. So contemporary meaning alive today, we study contemporary people. Historically recent just means um, like the, six, the 60s, for example, is still relevant to today, but we're not living in the same way that we did in the 60s, right? So sort of historically recent, but still relevant to today. And the main focus in cultural anthropology is, go figure, culture. Um, these shared ways of thinking and behaving, these customs and beliefs that are passed down among the group throughout generations. And we're interested in really all facets of human populations, all the different pieces of culture from economics, what is their subsistence uh, system? How do, they, how do they make a living in their environment? Are they fishers? Are they farmers? Are they gardeners? Do they work for wage labor like we do? Um, and how do they exchange goods? Is it on a market formally? Um, markets are relatively recent in human history. Um, there's other forms of exchange like reciprocity and sort of generalized sharing that dominate a lot of other societies uh, throughout time. What's their kinship system look like? How do they know who's in their family? 
that might seem obvious um, because we tend to think of family as based on biology, but it's also socially constructed. So that you may have a relative that you consider, let's say your paternal uncle, right? Your dad's brother, that's your uncle. That same biological relationship might exist among another group, but they don't even consider that person family because that's not how they recognize kinship. Um, marriage patterns, what's the, what's the marriage pattern like? Um, politics and law, what are, do they have formal or informal rules? Um, how do they go about resolving conflict? Is there sort of punishments? Is social stigmatization enough? What are their systems of belief and practice in the supernatural or what we often refer to as religion, which also includes, you know, magic, witchcraft? Um, why do they practice these things? Art, expressive culture, basically all facets of culture. Um, what are they like and how do they fit together? There's two main hallmarks or methods in anthropology. Um, ethnography. This is a written description of the way of life of some group. Uh, we'll be reading an ethnography in this class, Lines in the Water, which is about fishing villages around Lake Titicaca. Um, it's sort of a holistic written account of what's going on in this society. And then fieldwork is another main method in anthro. Uh, Fieldwork involves going out and actually living with the people participating in the research, learning the language, staying there for a long time, building rapport um, so that you can try and gain an insider perspective. And there's advantages to, to going out and being there rather than just uh, sending out survey questions and asking them what's going on. Um, and I'll come back to that later. Okay. Then there's this fifth sort of informal field, applied anthropology. So just a quick example from each of the subfields. In archeology, span one application is called repatriation. And so I don't know if any of you have ever heard of cultural resource management, CRM. It's a big thing in California. Anytime there's construction going on, they have to have an archeologist on site. In case uh, artifacts or or human remains or anything else is uncovered. And then we, if that happens, construction stops and the archeologists excavate the site um, because if they don't, it's just gonna be destroyed, right? And then that it's just gone. And so sometimes they do find human remains, um, which we're not gonna get into the ethics of, of digging those up, but we, we could uh, just for the sake of time. And so repatriation means essentially a giving back of those human remains to the ancestor group they belong to. I mean, like, for example, we're, we're on Kumeyaay land right now, right? So it's about whose, who's, you know, descendants, whose ancestors are these, what group does it belong to? And that's really important because different cultures have very different beliefs about how you treat the dead. And if you don't do it properly, that person might not make it where they're supposed to be. Right. And so it's sort of about respect for that. One example. Um, in biological anthropology, and I sort of touched on this already through identifying skeletal remains, um, who that person was through sexing or aging the bones or extracting DNA, hopefully bring closure to the families of those people, um, whether that be in during 9-11. Um, also, massive genocides in Guatemala and other places where victims are buried in these mass unmarked graves. Uh, they bring in forensic anthropologists to try to figure out who, who were these people. And linguistics. Um, I kind of just talked about this. So just to reiterate, uh, documenting endangered languages is one application. Um, not only to save the language and thus sort of the culture, but it's also can empower the local community, right? Give them some autonomy. And then there's a uh, cultural. So just taking an example from my own research in Solomon Islands, a big tsunami hit Solomon Islands and wiped out these two villages, Titiana and Pailange that I was doing my research in. Um, really severe impact, wiped out both villages, but the recovery process was very different and Titiana's recovery was much more hindered. And if you'll remember, it was related to social factors. Uh, in Solomon Islands, they have this pre-capitalist Melanesian social exchange network called the One Talk system. Um, your One Talks, people that speak your language, your relatives, people you're close with. And so when this post-disaster aid got distributed, it didn't go to victims on a basis proportional to need or impact. 
it traveled along these one talk networks so that people that were hooked into them that knew people with aid that had aid to distribute uh, received a lot whether or not the tsunami affected them other villages like Titiana um, really devastated and they're also a minority in the region largely disconnected from these Melanesian exchange networks got very little aid um, even though it was one of the worst impacts and so by actually understanding how disaster recovery played out here and the role of the one talk system um, hopefully you can use that to improve disaster mitigation in the future um, there's a few key concepts and approaches in anthropology that we need to talk about and then the first is holism. And so I already sort of mentioned this, the holistic approach. And this is the three concepts on this slide. This is important for the whole class. This is how all anthropologists sort of do what they do. We keep these concepts in mind. The holistic approach says that you cannot understand any single aspect of a culture in isolation, the history, the economy, politics, family size, unless you investigate and examine how that aspect is interrelated to the rest of the culture. You can't understand one piece in isolation. You have to look at all the parts in the context of the whole, okay? Holistic approach. So um, just for example, let's take, um, I keep saying um a lot, sorry. Let's take family size. How many children you decide, people decide to have? Uh, how is something seemingly as simple as how many kids you decide to have related to other aspects of a people's culture. And you can pick anywhere around the world, any time period, there's lots of different examples, but how's family size, how many kids you're going to have um, influenced by other things going on in the society, politics, economy, religion, technology. Um, what you got? I have an example that was influenced by China uh, or a political influence, you know, the one child policy. Mm hmm there I think that's yeah uh, and also on top of that one child policy that also skews your male to female like birth ratio if everyone wants to have one boy child their like ratio of men to women 20 or 30 years down the line is also going to be very skewed yeah good and that's actually happened to China um, so with with what both of you said the one child policy um, which has changed over time uh, but essentially it says families can have one child and that's it it was a population control mechanism and this is good because it highlights how this is all interrelated also in china in traditional culture and things are changing but there's this still relevant uh, things are changing so fast with globalization right uh there's a preference for male children because of their marital and um, post-marital residence patterns. And so traditionally, uh, the male child will stay in the household of birth and get married and the wife will come into that house and be yet another member of the household that will contribute to cooking or whatever other tasks need to be done. So if you can only have one child uh, and the males stay in the house, but females leave, they, once they get married, they go into the household of their husband and, and sort of are part of that household, contribute to that household. If you can only have one child, there became this preference for male children um, because that's, that's, that child stays in your house, brings in a wife. If you have a daughter, um, you invest in that child and then by the time they're sort of of age, they leave, right? They go invest in someone else's household. <coughs> Excuse me. And so actually the sex ratio did become skewed where there's more males than females there, which creates problems in terms of people trying to find a marriage partner now. Um, but yeah, all the way from sort of family size to politics to cultural preferences based off marriage and post marital residence patterns. Um, I saw a couple of hands. Go, go ahead. Cause I can't see. Oh, okay. Um, another example would be like in the agrarian communities. I know the U S like, you know, a century, two centuries ago, they were like this as well, but, um, they have bigger families to help out you know, uh, in their land and do a, a lot of work. Yeah, that's a huge one. Um, agrarian societies or farming families tend to have more kids. And I usually have students in my class that like grew up on a farm. And yeah, I had eight brothers and sisters. Um, it's a, it, it helps maintain the household. It's a source of labor, right? Um, whereas industrial, in industrial sort of wage labor society, um, 
you tend to see lower fertility rates. People have one, two children. Um, they're not working on a farm, so having nine children doesn't help you with the farm. And in industrial developed countries, kids tend to be expensive, right? Our parents probably spent half a million dollars on most of us, give or take, before we even got to needing to borrow money for college, if we're lucky enough to be able to, to do that, right? Um, so yeah, there's high fertility in agrarian families, um, which we'll actually see an example of next week. We're gonna watch a film about uh, agricultural groups in India and, and we'll talk about it when we get there. Good, any other uh, sort of examples or comments on that family size in relation to all these other things? Um, would, any, would, would anything like uh, contraceptives also have to do with that, with culture as well? Absolutely, yeah. I think something like, and I'm, I don't know if this has changed since I last looked it up, but like 25% of pregnancies globally are unplanned, right? So just the very avail availability of contraception can change family size. And then just to add on that, you could add in different religions which have prescriptions about whether or not you should use birth control. So absolutely, that's a perfect example. Okay, so I, th I think we get the point, right? It's all interrelated and you can't sort of look at just one piece and, and really understand it unless you're looking at all the pieces in the context of the whole. So my question, this is maybe one of my favorite examples of, of anything. Who knows why cornflakes were created? Why were cornflakes in the sort of early 1900s created? For what? It's specifically related to masturbation. Absolutely. Yeah, to stop masturbation. Um, workout food. So the shit about a healthy breakfast got tacked on way fucking later. Um, I get, they send books, anthropology books, and I was flipping through this and I came across this example of holism. And so this is, just find the page, where uh, cornflakes come from. I'm just going to read the passage to you. Um, can't understand why we have cereal without understanding 19th century cultural attitudes in America towards sexual deviance. Um, let us begin by posing a simple question. Why do so many Americans prefer cereal for breakfast? Most of us do because it's part of a healthy and nutritious diet, the standard industry line, or because of its convenience. In any event, eating cereal for breakfast has become a social norm for a majority of Americans. It builds on positive cultural values attributed to health and on the symbolism healthy food equals a healthy body. But cornflakes began in the 19th century as a cure for sexual deviance, masturbation being the most worrisome. 19th century religious leaders considered masturbation an abomination and the emerging scientific disciplines of psychiatry and surgery claimed masturbation caused shyness, hairy palms, jaundice, insanity, cancer, um, and murderous behavior. And just, oh my God, for fun, can you guys see this? Oh, I can't see my face. This is what you will look like if you masturbate. That's what will happen to you. This is literally what scientists are publishing this shit. Okay, it gets better though. Uh, the US Patent Office from 1861 to 1932 issued some two dozen patents on anti-masturbation devices to prevent boys from masturbating. Among them, a safety pin to close the foreskin of the penis, various kinds of male chastity belts, an electric bell attached to the penis that would notify parents if their son got an erection during the night. As recently as 1918, a U.S. government brochure, keep this in mind when your government is telling you what you should do and not do. 1918, a U.S. government brochure advised new parents to prevent their babies from masturbating by tying their baby's hands and legs to the sides of their cribs. Circumcision became the most commonly performed surgery in the United States based on the view that it prevented masturbation. John Harvey Kellogg, the inventor of cornflakes, was a physician from Battle Creek, Michigan. He was a follower of the health food movement of vegetarian and dietary reformer Sylvester Graham, who had developed graham flour used in graham crackers. When Kellogg became director of the SDA church in Battle Creek, it's a religious sect, he built on Graham's ideas, inventing cornflakes and various granolas as food for his patients. Both men were concerned with health and sexuality and especially abhorred masturbation, which they attributed to 
animalistic passions that were enhanced by a rich, meaty, or spicy diet. Both believed that bland but healthy foods, boring foods, uh, were the way to soothe these volatile and unhealthy sexual urges. Um, eating cereal has never prevented masturbation, of course, uh, and no one today would argue that it does. Over time, the meaning of both cereal and masturbation has shifted. In fact, these days, an increasing number of medical professionals embrace masturbation as good for mental health. But the initial assumption that masturbation was abhorrent and that bland food could curb it were enough to create cornflakes. Uh, during the 19th century, the American breakfast, like the rest of the diet, was a hearty meal of meat, eggs, fish, biscuits, gravy, jams, butter. Although farmers worked off the calories in their fields, as Americans became more urban, such rich meals became a sign of prosperity, just as the ideal body type was a full body, full body for men and women. But American culture became, uh, began valuing healthy eating in the early 20th century, and industrial cereal makers like Kellogg's brother William took advantage of this connection between cereal and good health. And it's in the 20s that they started tacking all that crap on about it's good for your health. Um, so in answering our initial question, last thing about why many Americans prefer cereal for breakfast, we see interrelationships between separate domains like belief about sexual morality, good health, social institutions and power, expert knowledge, medical practices, and daily life. Uh, this is the holistic perspective, right? Holism. You want to understand where cornflakes come from? You got to understand all this other stuff, right? It has nothing to do with sort of your diet. Next sort of concept that we need to cover is the comparative approach. And so this says, before we make any generalization about humans or culture as a whole, we need to compare across a wide range of cultures uh, before making generalization. And it's so important because we often mistakenly assume that um, the beliefs and customs that are familiar to us apply to people everywhere. And that's usually not the case. Uh, people do things differently for different reasons. And so before trying to generalize about humans or cultures, we need to compare throughout space and time. Um, just in relation to this class, you'll, you'll hear people say, part of environmental problems today, it's, it's human nature, right? We're, we naturally degrade the environment. And I'm not saying that, I'm just saying it's people say that. That's not true, right? There, we, and we will see in this class, there are lots of different cultures that have existed sustainably, managed their resources in ways that have not degraded their environment through for long periods of time. Um, it's not humans per se that create environmental degradation by no means. It's the specific sociocultural organization, right? Um, more on that later. And then uh, sort of the last thing on here, uh, two interrelated terms. Uh, cultural relativism is a really important one. And so this says that no culture is inherently superior or inferior to another one. Um, <clears throat> you don't want to evaluate uh, the customs or morals or behaviors of another group according to the standards and values of your own. Because uh, people's values are usually dependent on their culture, and people's values therefore vary depending on their culture. So there's usually no right or wrong, they're just different for different reasons. Um, can anyone think, we'll talk about ethnocentrism in a second, which is kind of the opposite uh, view, of an example of something that's considered sort of wrong or morally sinful in our society, but is totally okay in another society, or vice versa? Uh, human sacrifice? Yeah, and so, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but in general, not okay here, right? At least not in the formal way we think of it. Um, whereas maybe the Aztecs who did practice human sacrifice, right? The part of their culture. Well, sorry, whoever just spoke up, what were you going to say? Each of consent. Can you say that again? Each of consent. Age of consent. Yeah. So thank you. Um, yeah, this varies widely. So for us, right, you're kind of considered an adult once you're 18. And if you're below that age, you can't really, um, you can't consent necessarily to, and actually that varies by the state too, that age is lower in certain states. But like in the Solomon Islands, for example, um, you're not considered an adult at a certain age you are sort of on your own, you can make your own choices for yourself once you get married. That's sort of the marking of becoming an adult for them. 
Um, and then if you get divorced, that's fine. You're still considered an adult, but that's like the rite of passage. Whereas for us, it's turning a certain age, something like that. Um, um, child also, marriage. Go ahead. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I'll sit a backpack off of kind of that. Um, so like in the Hindu culture, like cows are sacred to the Hindu culture. And here we eat cows. Yeah, ahimsa, sort of this principle in Hinduism, that religion that their cows are sacred. They're not to be eaten. They're not to be killed. Um, but we, we totally, well, not all of us, but in this society, that's not taboo, right? We have major food producing companies that are literally changing the landscape of our country based off growing, growing animals, um, raising them. Right? Yeah, what else? Um, eating insects, eating meat, um, burping, being rude. Yeah, you generally, um, like I would say, excuse me if I accidentally did that. You guys still might be grossed out. You might not care. Um, Solomon Islands, no. You totally don't have to say excuse me for burping. Uh, there's other things you should not do or release from your body that are still offensive. Um, birth control. Can you elaborate, Will, on what you mean by that a little bit? Um, well... Like reproductive rights, I guess you could say, could vary from country to country. And I mean, that's sort of what I meant by that. Like, yeah, good. And so I don't mean to put you on the spot either. Just I don't want to um, assume I know what you mean. But yeah, sort of who has who has the power over decision making? Um, is it both heads of the household, sort of the female and the male? Is it only the male? Um, there's, do the females even have access to birth control? Um, is that stigmatized? That's a big one. Um, homosexuality. Yeah. And interestingly, you know, on that note, talking about homosexuality, so, um, sexual orientation being the sort of the general term, hetero, homo, somewhere, um, along the spectrum, that's actually, um, like third and fourth gender roles and, and different sexual orientations. That's more the universal um, that's actually quite common among different societies throughout space and time. They have accepted and even institutionalized sort of third and fourth genders rather than the binary sort of man, woman that corresponds to the binary sex of male, female. Um, and it's, it's an accepted and embraced thing, right? Um, it's not, it, the way our society treats that, and I'm referring to sort of those that would deny people human rights based off their so sexual orientation, that's not sort of true in a lot of other places. It depends on where you're talking about, right? But um, binary gender, that's a cultural construction, right? Um, good, okay, so lot, yeah, a good example of um, Hiras in India. So someone brought up, um, I think you said, I think they said female genital mutilation. Um, let's talk about that. Cause this, so this, let's complicate things a little bit. Okay. Um, female genital mutilation also called female circumcision. And it, the words you use is kind of a stance, right? And um, try to be careful when we do this. So there's two types of relativism, methodological and moral. So methodological relativism, this is sort of what most anthropologists do. Um, things are relative. People eat meat, don't eat meat. They uh, build their houses this way versus that. They do things differently because they have different resources, different environments. Um, and that's what culture is, sort of an adaptation to the environment populations inhabit. So we see that as relative. There's no sort of right or wrong, good or bad, superior, or inferior. It's just different for different reasons. Um, you don't want to judge other groups according to your own standards, right? But in methodological relativism, we do draw a line in the sand. And that line is human rights violations, um, things like murder or rape, uh, that, that we would just say is not relative, is not sort of okay in just how they do that, right? There's sort of some, some things that are not seen as okay in a universal sense. It's tricky because anyone making that value judgment about what crosses that line is coming from their own culture, right? And that's gonna color sort of where they draw that line. So that's methodological. We do draw a line at human rights. Not, not okay, not just relative, it's a problem. Then there's moral relativism. And in contrast, what moral relativism says is uh, everything goes. There's no line in the sand, um, it's all relative, right? Sort of no 
single thing is not okay. It's, there's just no line drawn. It's all relative, even all morals, including sort of rape, murder, all. it's just the way they do things. I don't know anyone that actually subscribes to moral relativism, right? And so the example one of you brought up, um, female circumcision, also called female genital mutilation. And for those of you that aren't familiar with what that is, uh, it occurs in certain cultures in some different places around the world. And it depends on the group we're talking about, so it manifests slightly differently. But essentially what is done is when the female is usually younger, um, sometimes maybe a teenager, they undergo a procedure in which a piece of the female reproductive anatomy is removed. And there is sensation, there's nerve endings in this piece of anatomy that's removed, this piece of tissue, um, and that you don't get back, right? That's, it's just removed. Um, also in these societies, oftentimes, uh, female circumcision is sort of a rite of passage, uh, marks you as sort of an acceptable, you know, marriage partner or whatever. And so those that don't undergo it um, sometimes face cultural stigmatization, right? They might have a hard time finding a marriage partner, da, da, da. So I think um, it's really easy sort of sitting where we are to say, that seems like that crosses that line, right? Uh, in the sand into sort of, that, that's you know, not okay, right? But um, there's a practice in our country that also involves uh, removing a piece of tissue from the reproductive anatomy um, when the individual is very young, that, so they don't have a choice, it's just done to them. And there's also a shit ton of nerve endings in this piece of tissue that gets removed, that the person can never again feel that sensation. Um, what am I talking about now? Does anyone know? Male circumcision? Yeah, yes. And my point is not to, to pick on that or say that it's bad or this or that. The point is to highlight how these two practices actually share some parallels. You remove this piece of the anatomy, it takes the sensation away from the person. They may be culturally stigmatized if they don't overgo it and undergo it in their society. Um, I'm not trying to say they're the same. I'm not trying to demonize any, but it gets blurry. It gets messy right? We start out sort of black and white, but there's all this gray area, right? What, what makes one okay and not the other? Um, the, what your culture tells you. Your culture tells you what to value and not to value. Whereas most of us probably don't have, I don't know, I don't know, because things are changing. At least 20 years ago, I don't think there was a lot of strong feelings about um, not circumcising males. That's actually changing, right? Um, and again, I'm not saying it's good or bad, but what makes one okay and the other not when they kind of have some similarities is the culture. One is familiar to us, seems normal, seems like, oh, yeah, that's how we do it. And the other one's not. Someone want to say something? Question. Yeah. Oh, was someone else talking? No, you. Okay. Um, does this tie into sustainability? Like, like these this type of taboo or is this like mainly and an, from an anthropological standpoint and like the those type of societal taboos yeah so this is we're doing sort of anthropology right now okay. um because be, i think before we can get into how does anthropology deal with sustainability sort of what does anthropology have to say why do how what makes us different than sociology or biology? Um, and one of the things that makes us different is being aware of culture and the power of it, right? Okay. And how much it really does influence uh, human behavior. As you will see, or my goal is to convince you that you cannot achieve nor understand sustainability if you do not understand culture. Um, that's what this class, Sustainability and Culture, is all about. So um, ethnocentrism, real quick, is the opposite of cultural relativism. So it's this attitude or opinion that your own way of doing things, your morals, your values, your customs, your beliefs are superior to other groups of people. Uh, sort of the graph, sort of a graph for you. Our culture is superior. Um, the tan is agree, blue disagree. Italy, right? Almost 70%. Yeah, we're better. U.S., sort of second place, uh, fairly ethnocentric. Uh, Canada, Spain, Germany, France, Britain. I think Sweden is sort of the most humble there on the bottom, only about a small section of them thinking their culture is superior. And so we want to avoid ethnocentrism in this course. Um, 
there's two types. There's mild ethnocentrism where you kind of think that the way you do things is, is good. It works for you. And we all have a little bit of that because, and it makes sense. If we didn't think the way we were doing things was a good way to do it, we wouldn't fucking do it that way. Right. So we all have a little bit of that. And anthropologists don't find that objectionable. What we find objectionable that has no place in anthropology or really humanity is extreme ethnocentrism where you evaluate another group according their values, their morals, their customs, according to how closely they match your own. Um, and then you rank it right. According to how closely it matches your own yourself being at the top, of course, um, this has no place in anthropology. Again, cultural relativism, different uh, for different reasons. And Isabella asked, uh, wouldn't ethnocentrism tie into nationalism as well? Absolutely. Um, Nationalism is a form of ethnocentrism, right? Where you promote sort of the nation and the values, what, you know, whoever's values those are above all other nations. Um, sort of the America first. Yeah, it's ethnocentric. Um, and nationalism is actually pretty dangerous. Uh, I'm not going to go there today, but um, we're not living in normal times. Just say that. Go out and vote. Okay. Uh, a few more things before we get out of here for the day. Uh, field work. This is the main way that we collect our data in anthropology. But you go out and actually live with the people participating in the research uh, to try to get an insider perspective. Um, it's long term, months to years. It's on site. You learn the language. I learned Solomon Islands Pigeon. And then speaking in their own language to them, you can, you can find out a lot more, right? You can have a conversation. You can build rapport. Uh, all types of techniques for data collection. And this is just to give you an idea what we do. Um, interviewing, participant observation, where you're there to observe, ask questions, but also participate, do what they're doing, try to get that insider view. Um, surveys, you can map out households, resource use, archival research. After the tsunami, there was this huge audit report that came out that actually showed um, huge amounts of money missing, like who wrote the check and who cashed the check and didn't actually give it to the victim. So anything you can get your hands on to sort of supplement, you know, what happened, what's going on here. And so I spent uh, about three months out over a few different years in Solomon Islands researching what happened from the tsunami. And again, if you're not there to just ask questions, but uh, participate, right? Dress up, picture on the bottom of me dressed up looking like an idiot in traditional Kiribati garb. What well, Kiribati's next to me in a jeans and t-shirt. Um, you eat the food, go gardening, go fishing, do what they do. Try to sort of see things from their perspective um, or get as close as you can. So there's advantages uh, to being there to see what people are doing versus just asking them. Um, Actually, on that note, why, why not just sort of sit here and email surveys out to, let's pretend they would receive them and just email or mail out my questions to the villages and just collect my data that way. What's good about actually being there? What I'm thinking of is, is what people say they do is not the same always as what we actually do, right? If you don't know what I mean, think about I, this is the example I used in the last class was your parents back when you lived at home or if you still do ask you, what time did you get home last night? Right. I know I always told my parents whatever time I was supposed to be home. That was the answer. This is maybe not when I got home. Right. What we say we do is not always the same as what we do. And so being there to actually observe what's going on can help add observations that you otherwise couldn't get, right? Um, yeah, to avoid armchair anthropology. Good. Armchair anthropologists, sort of people sitting back in their office and then uh, analyzing other societies from like written records and accounts from missionaries and sort of ranking them. Um, that's not how we do anthropology today. You need to go out and actually experience that society um, work with them if you want to have any idea what's actually going on. Um, just a quick example. Uh, if you, when you go to the doctor, they ask you all sorts of questions, and one of them is usually, how much do you drink? Um, and so I know we're all super honest probably about that, and, you know, two glasses of wine a week. Um, no one says 37 drinks a week. And I'm, that's not true for me. Um, 
people cut it under a little bit. Usually my mom told me a friend of hers is a doctor. If whatever you tell the doctor, they automatically double whatever you tell them because they're assuming that you're sort of lying about it, right? What we say we do not always the same as what we do. One other example from the Solomons, um, they, Carita told me this. So they're largely Christian. Now they've been missionized, but they'll still talk about their old custom religion. And they'll say, we don't believe this now, right? We're Christian, but, and then they'll tell you sort of this cool story. So she was telling me one night, they sweep a lot. It's called brooming in pigeon. And because you're walking around in the sand, there's dirt all over the floors of the house, you sweep it up. And she said, Savannah, Los Solomons, you can't, you can, you're not supposed to sweep at night. And the reason is because you have all these ancestor spirits sort of protecting the household. Uh, so if you sweep, you're essentially brushing them out of the house. They won't be there to sort of look over you at night. Uh, she said, no sweeping. But if you have to sweep at night, then uh, make sure you don't dump it outside, right? So that you're not dumping the ancestor spirits outside. And so she's telling me this really cool sort of custom story. But literally, like right after she tells me, she like throws all the dirt and the, the stuff she just swept up out the fucking door into the night sky. Um, so what people say, what they do not always the same. And so being there to actually see can help give you a more holistic account of what's actually going on. And so the last thing we need to talk about is emic versus edict perspectives. Um, the emic is the insider view. Um, what has meaning for the person inside the culture? The edict is the outsider's view. Um, what's the meaning of this? When I say this to you, what's it mean? Yeah. Hey, okay. All good. Yeah. Uh, it, it's like an acknowledgement or yes, you're good. Um, when I do this to you, you know, I am not doing this, right? Very different symbolism. The reason when I go like this to you, you know what I mean is because we all have an emic shared understanding of that symbol. If you do this in another culture, this is pejorative. It basically means go fuck yourself, right? So that culture determines that meaning. The emic is that shared understanding of the meaning. Um, the edict is sort of the outsider observation. I don't know. She's touching her thumb to her finger. Um, and so this is sort of the last really important thing that we need to get into. Um, but let's go ahead and we'll stop it there. Um, we'll finish this up next time. And then we'll move into these specific approaches um, in terms of anthropology, the interpretive, the materialist. Um, ultimately ending with sort of Bodley's approach. And I'll break down for you these different worlds he's talking about. So we're building sort of towards Bodley and then we'll move way beyond theory.